Cheers. Happy Equinox. Welcome to a new chapter. What new chapter are you opening into? I'm imagining that these last few weeks has been very um, deep and perhaps informative, perhaps um, resolving or um, giving you a sense of as all this energy moves into the next cycle, as the sun has moved into Aries today for a fresh new beginning, what is it that you are moving forward? What is your trajectory and where do you have energy to give towards? We've kind of concentrated and gathered and now it's this like shooting that fire arrow of being born into something new. So cheers. It's nice to be back. I haven't been here for a while and I'm kind of sleepy today. I am fitting it into my schedule, hoping, hope, hoping that Bija won't wake up. If he does, he might run in here and <sighs> it's nice to be here though. Um, there's two main things I want to focus on today. Um, one is the Mercury retrograde in Pisces and its conspiration and collaboration with Neptune in Pisces and a big move that Neptune's about to make for us Gene Keys human design people. Um, the other being Uranus moving into Taurus. So let's start with the Mercury retrograde. <sighs> it's been Pisces season. And Mercury retrograde, um, ha this has been a very poignant cycle. Um, I like to watch sometimes the ways that for instance, Mercury, it went, it stationed retrograde on March 5th at, at the 29th degree of Pisces. It's definitely making a statement saying, okay, we're going to grab this, this whole thing with the final degree of Pisces. We're going to, and we're going to encapsulate it into our contemplation and really pull something through. Perhaps, perhaps a thread of Pisces shadow that we've never been able to unravel. We're going to get there this time. I'm very Scorpionic, so I like to think in those intense terms. <laughs> so um, it it's stationed retrograde and then it's moved back through Pisces. And when it stations direct on March 28th, it's going to be conjunct at 16 degrees exact with Neptune, the ruler of Pisces. So it's, it's having a powwow with the active agent of of how the Pisces need is fulfilled in all of us, this need for transcendence, for unity, to surrender and open, come into the reality of us all being in this together. There's been so much, you know, turmoil in the um, social dynamics in the planes of you know, the social, political, economic climate in our cultures. There's so much turmoil and things breaking apart and shifts of power and all of this that I've talked a lot about over the last year and I will continue to um, as the node comes to conjunct Pluto and Saturn and Pluto come to get very close this spring before backing off and coming into their first conjunction January 2020. But that's not the focus of today. Today is to say... Man, we've been having to face some really hard places in ourselves and deal with this deep, you know, issues of control and uh, misuse of power and all this corruption and how it plays out inside and how it's playing out outside. And this Neptune Pisces season over the last month, um, specifically with the Mercury retrograde and Sun and Pisces, there's just been this like, compassion, this opportunity for greater compassion of how we are all in this and we all play our part and to really come home and, and grow our capacity for empathy. That's something that feels really important right now that we learn how to empathize with ourselves and be with ourselves in some of the most 
uncomfortable, unconscious places of our suffering. Because even if you've been doing self-work, you know, there's always deeper layers of where the unconscious guilt is held. That's, that's a theme of Pisces. Pisces, if you think about it, it's so merged that other people's pain, it's so easy to, to kind of to have that register as our own pain and then to take it in as if it was our fault. So it's very hard to discern in Pisces what's who's who's and what's what. Um, and so you may have found yourself having to deal with parts of your past um, or dynamics in your relationships or just places in your body where there's reservoirs of guilt. Just thinking about how much guilt kind of colors um, our, my, you know, contemplating this for myself, social relationships. Like, oh, oh I'm so sorry. Uh, I don't want to feel bad about making you feel bad and, uh, you know, or how I thought that my parents, you know, what their troubles were somehow my fault. And so how does that live in my body? And I've just been seeing so much um, the signs and the symbols for myself of how to relax and how to really whoo, come into regulating my nervous system. And part of Pisces is these energetic frequencies, like tapping into the invisible forces of our, you know, bioelectric aura and just our the energetics of healing and regulating the nervous system to have a calm state. It's as if when I do that, I am part, I'm, I'm regulating the collective nervous system. If more and more people attune to the nervous system and the sensitivities and what's needed there, and there's so much to be regulated, you know, there's so much hyper, you know, activity and, um, you know, reasons for not being calm, um, but just feeling the power of that. Um, so I want to talk about specifically right now, uh, and maybe to wrap up the Mercury retrograde, just what ha what has been happening for you? Um, things that I've been tracking in my life and um, and the life of people I know around me. Uh, lots of dreaming, dreaming not only at night, like big dreams coming through at night, um, but also um, dreaming into the future, like dreaming into what's coming and what we want, and visioning. You know, a lot of that's happening. Um, a lot of um, healing work I've been hearing about people, like I've said, dealing with unconscious guilt. Um, the transcendent healing power of art. That's been coming through really strong with music and visual art coming in really big. Also, like film and how symbol and archetype and film is really a vehicle for awakening. Um, hearing more and more people talk about like, oh, I'm watching this show that has this character that's really holding this important reflection for myself to know, to either like learn from these mistakes or really aim for this one kind of archetype that I really need to call more into my body, into my life and my psyche. So that's pretty cool, the power of film. Um, also like psychedelic experiences more journeying, more like uh, wanting to go out into the cosmos and kind of understand our place in the whole thing. I started watching the show um, One Strange Rock, which is, you know, just such a Piscean, like understanding our role in the cosmos. It's also very Uranian, too. Uh, there's some similarities between Pisces and Aquarius being universal and of the, you know, one kind of unified consciousness in a sense. So moving on to Neptune, um, speaking to this big transition, I very dramatically put your, uh, Neptune right on the cusp there brrr, to say that um, on March 29th, the day after Mercury turn stations uh, direct, conjunct Neptune, Neptune will be moving into the 22nd gene key. Um, I actually didn't look at how long it will be there. <laughs> I could check right now. Um, it hasn't been there for 150 odd years. Neptune's obviously a very slow moving planet. Um, so 
this is a really big shift. I'm looking down at my <laughs> ephemeris here to see when does Neptune move out of the 22? It's there for, it's there for, you know, I'm seeing two, two years so, so far. Um, looks like about two years and then it, it dips back in. So we're looking at about hmm, almost three years. Yeah, basically three years. Yeah. Okay, so March 2022 is when it will move out of 22. So, wow. Um, three years, three next three years, um, Neptune in the 22nd Jinky, which uh, is one of the master Jinkies, of grace. Um, grace is the city, the um, divine essence, the shadow being dishonor, and the gift of graciousness. This is one of the two big gene keys that has a really strong transmission. And of the two, 55 being the other, um, it's 22 is the involution. It's the, it's the feminine that it's this receiver dish that draws divine energy down into this material plane. So there's a lot to say. Um, Neptune is also the receiver dish. Like that's what it is. It's if you look at the symbol, it's these two arms like open up to the heavens. It is that spiritual, um, you know, transmitter or like receiver of the spiritual invisible energies, and you know, relating that to the human experience. And so uh, there's just so. Um, there's such a divine mother kind of energy about this and we're going to spend time contemplating it um, over the years. But right now, I think what I want to talk about um, before we move on is I feel like because the 22 really deals with this, okay, we're going to, we're going to really heal at an emotional level and we're ultimately we're going to treat each other with deep kindness and understanding and and heal through our relationships with each other at the shadow we take it on and we get all caught up in the dramas of each other's stuff and we dishonor ourselves and each other um through the process so part of what i'm contemplating right now is i guess it's twofold one is just understanding and honoring the power of our impact on the people around us and their healing journeys. So there's kind of a two things. When someone's in their wounding, we can either play into their projection of who their wound is expecting us to be. So let's say we're caught up in something with someone and they have this wound that expects us to treat them a certain way. We either play into that and keep the thing going and ourselves get all <laughs> um, ensnared into that, you know, that whole wounding pattern. Um, and, and that's just kind of reinforcing the same old story that probably came through in childhood. Um, or we don't play into their projections and we offer this opportunity for them to integrate this capacity that they they're just trying to overcome this old belief and we help disconfirm that for them and we help to um almost re-imprint the the psyche the the you know neurochemical um pathway that brings in that new possibility and helps them stabilize at an optimal you know potentiation of that function whatever that wound, whatever that need that's associated um, with, you know, the dynamic, whatever's happening there. So when I, when I realize that, and it's, it's kind of similar for us, like secretly when we're like treating someone like, or asking them to subconsciously asking them to play into our stuff, um, actually underneath it all, we really want them to to prove us wrong. We really want them to do it differently and sh model for us what is a healthy dynamic here. And I just feel like with Neptune in the 22, there's gonna be a lot of these opportunities for healing in the interrelational fields. Um, and yeah, so honoring the power of our relationships to help in us all integrate into higher capacities and out of the wound patterns. 
Okay, so the second thing I wanted to speak to here, which has been coming up a lot lately, is this, um, um, it's kind of like, I, the easiest way I could put it is shadow work and uh, law of attraction, kind of new age, positive thinking, you know, um, aim for what you want, dream into that, feel it as a possible, you know, as right here, right now. And then like at the other side, you know, make contact with the wound, um, be present with your suffering, allow, accept, embrace the discomfort. You know, this is more of the realm of the jinkies, but I've, Richard's always talking about well, always, I mean, he, he does talk about, like, focus on the gifts in the cities, like, they will lift you up and out, but there's this balance, and I'm sort of contemplating, like, what is the fine balance, because it feels like a very fine line, where it's so easy to, let's say, move into the more, like, positive thinking, I'm going to just focus on what I want, and who I want to be, or who I'm becoming, and that becoming bypass and covering up the wound. On the other hand, it's really easy to um, go too far in wanting to validate the shadow to the point of indulgence. So I just need to be with this, I just need to be with this when there's this opportunity for you to kind of just shift out and stabilize into a new way of, be, of being or a behavior that's really actually what you want so what is this balance and I, I it's not there's I don't think there's really an answer just you know how do, how do we maintain balance we just know like when to kind of tilt one way or the other but it comes down to trusting ourselves and you know learning <laughs> Um, and all, ultimately awareness, you know, is what's being cultivated and a felt, a felt sense and integration of our wounding, but then a reference reframe and shifting towards what we want. So that's just been coming up for me a lot lately. And I thought maybe it had to do with this. So I thought I'd sprinkle it in. Maybe it's relevant for you too. I don't know. <sighs> Yeah, honoring our wounds while simultaneously gaining traction in our growth and our potential. All right, let's move on to Uranus. Um, two things about Uranus. Um, in March 5th, uh, the day that Mercury stationed retrograde, um, it entered into Taurus for the next seven years. And last uh, 2018, we had a bit of time with... Uranus in the early degrees of Taurus here. Um, yeah, I, I, I realized like I wanted, uh, I'm going to add something in here about people who were born with planets in the early degrees of Scorpio, of Taurus, even of Leo and Aquarius. This is a really stirring your, your world up. Um, and I want to also just say for every time we're tracking these transits, like specific, you know, just this last segment on Mercury retrograde and, and Neptune, if you have planets in this area, you're going to be uh, having a deeper, you know, there might be bigger things happening in your life, events, people, relationships, things dissolving, um, you know, things changing, you know. Uh, creating the the perfect situation scenario for you to be learning integrating and um, reorienting and calibrating towards that next level that the transit will be bringing you into um, also because we we are the zodiac we have all of these parts of ourselves um, what house is that in you know what domain is that um, in, you know, influencing you and where's that impact going to be felt? Because oftentimes people will show up that have to do with that domain. So for instance, if Mercury retrograde is transiting your sixth house, you might be having encounters with, um, people in your workplace. If it's up in the 10th house, it might be authority figures that you start to have a relationship 
dynamic with that's teaching you something about your own relationship with authority, you know, in and with all of the the added dimensions of Pisces and how it has to do with your communication and lens on reality. So um, that's always wonderful to kind of have context for these transits. And the reason why I'm bringing up the um, specifically early Scorpio is because I was born in 1984 when Pluto entered Scorpio at zero degrees. And I'm thinking like 84, 85 people who were born in that time zone you're going to be particularly feeling this Uranus transit as a, a deep, deep um, stirring of integration, of healing wounds. And Pluto is stimulated to go into the shadow in order to heal and, you know, stimulated by Uranus and oftentimes confronted through relationships. People in your life will bring you opportunities to integrate parts of yourself. And we'll get a little deeper into that. But also, if you were born in um, 1955, 56, 57, you would have Neptune there. And so a, a similar thing, um, but having to do with transcendence, unity, and surrender, um, perhaps stimulating old um, victim relationships, relationships where you felt victimized. Um, there's just this integration, again, Scorpio, of wounding through relationships. Um, so yeah, feel how that awakening is happening and and you don't have to be born in 84 or 55 to, to also be experiencing this major shift. Um, Uranus in Taurus. Uranus is the universal mind. It's um, the quantum reality. It's, it's here to evolve, you know, whatever it's touching and bring holistic thinking and, um, you know, St you know, stimulate advances in technologies. So here's some riffing around on that. Um, Taurus being the earth, Taurus being the most earth, nature, our body, um, becoming conscious, Uranus, of our bodies, our nature, um, ourselves as nature, starting to experience this microcosm of this body as um, a, a living organism that reflects and mirrors the macro organism of an ecosystem of the earth itself and tending to the health here um, as a way to actually revolutionize change. Um, you probably hear a lot of people, um, if you follow astrology, like go out and explore, like people are talking about you know, breakthroughs in food technologies, food production, the economy, cryptocurrency. The last time that Uranus was in Taurus was in 1934. Um, that's when it entered and it was around the time of the Great Depression and the New Deal, lots of economic reform. There, um, so there's a lot to learn about the previous cycles. Um, but it was interesting. I was thinking about like this time around, interesting, like technology, we're starting to, like, there wasn't computers back in the 30s, and now there are. But now it's in, so Uranus is in Taurus. Oh, our bodies are bioelectric computers themselves. So what if we're starting to see advancements in, techno in the technology of our bodies? Um, the activation of these bioelectric computers as sources of intelligence and, and ways to actually, you know, tools for dot, dot, dot. Um, and a lot of, you know, this all kind of, this is like, yay, wonderful thinking, like how great, but let's kind of touch on Taurus as an archetype. Taurus is um, wanting to meet the need for security, for safety, for comfort. Um, this is related to the developmental cycle of when we are like 18 months or two years old to about five. It's those toddler years where we want constancy because we start to realize that there is a world outside of ourselves. Aries doesn't know that. It's just so one with everything. It, it just has no differentiation from self and, and its environment. But when you're a toddler, you start to notice, oh, people go away, and then they're, oh, and then, but, and that, the, they're their own people, and I, 
So the feeling of insecurity starts to come and you want to it, like find that sense of consistency and something you can rely on. Hence, stuffed animals, you know, having a, a little blankie or they, you know, things can become that. But one really big, uh, this cool thing I've been learning about is how at that age we internalize the mental representation of mother. And if it's secure and stable, then when mom goes away physically, then I'm able to actually self-soothe by having a connection with that internal mental representation, which is almost like this internal mother. So, wow, like mother, if we think of that as a metaphor for the earth, our relationship to the earth, as the ground for the child's love of self, even just how we have mother figures, you know, if we're adults, like how can we have healthy people in our lives that help us to imprint that sense of safety where we can, if we didn't have security in that way and we weren't tended to and didn't feel that security that we can still imprint our, our nervous system, our psyche, and we're, you know, we're malleable. The, the plasticity of the mind, we can actually create healthy imprints and back to this Neptune kind of relational field of how we can do that with each other. So we can model healthy, safe harbors and places of constancy for people that they can rely on us. Um, so um, radical self-sourcing, Uranus and Taurus. Um, Taurus is about becoming self-sufficient on a foundation of deep self-love like you know you know you're good because no matter where you go and you're alone you've always got yourself you're contained in yourself and you don't need the lover you don't need the thing but oh boy is it one you know incredibly sensually gratifying to experience pleasure so Taurus is always also related to pleasure because when we're imprinting around those ages, pleasure in the body starts to come online and that's knowing that we are alive and safe and secure is to feel the body, feel you know, the bar of soap in our hands or feel the teddy bear's softness on our skin. It's, it's this, um, yeah, as a way that we know that we're safe and feel ourselves as whole. So I um, am tagging some things here. So our capacity for pleasure in the body, this is naturally going to involve healing from sexual traumas. Um, we just know how how much we deal with this, th this end of things, how much sexual trauma is out there and how in a sense, it's just a cultural climate of trauma we all have traumas, but, you know, specifically uh, this body thing about being safe in the body has a lot to do with sexuality. So my feeling, you know, I'm just like kind of pu putting pieces together is that this is going to be m even more of a time for somatic movements in trauma therapy, um, Hakomi uh, attachment therapy, sexual healing, um, you know, all of the, the tantric arts, but in a really grounded therapeutic sense of helping people come back and, and be sourced and, you know, overcome the trauma in the body so that they can feel safe. And that's just a really important thing right now. So, um, yeah, I think the, what I want to phase into, and then we'll kind of close here is that, um, Uranus is going to be moving into the 27th gene key on April 14th. Um, and it was in, it was in the 27 last summer from July to September, um, for a little stint, but it's going to be, um, moving in April 14th until May of next year, uh, in which case it may move back in, but that's the first, if for a good year, um, Uranus is going to be in the 27. That th this gene key moves from the shadow of selfishness to altruism and selflessness. And oh, I just there's such a pulse around this. Um it feels like how we negotiate meeting needs in relationships. 
um, having needs ourselves, like claiming what we need when we need it and how to do that in a graceful way. And then being able to show up for others and serve and be available to really like track like, oh, what's needed here? Who, you know, and to give of ourselves to each other. Um, there's so much wounding around this. I think just at a psychological level, wounds are often bound up with particular needs that haven't have been deemed too dangerous or too painful to express. There's so much shame that we carry around having needs at all. And this is a lot about the moon function in, in astrology and how um, how were our needs tended to when we were children and kind of related to the mother archetype. And obviously we have so much wounding around the mother and even just our relationship with the earth itself is so represented in that, the way that we strip the, the um, resources. And so... Um, this is big because as we tend to each other's needs and learn how to do that, we are really integrating our wounds and we're doing a lot of healing in our relationships. So gosh, it feels like everything is just kind of coming back to integration, um, healing, empathy, um, compassion, self sourcing and then how when we self-regulate um, and self-source we are um, we're doing that on the collective level as a microcosm um, and how we can access healing on a larger scale by finding and locating it in the depth of our being all right, loves, I feel like we've gone for a while now. Maybe I'll, since it's the equinox, I'm going to roll a planet and um, see what planet just wants to say hello here for a moment. So our collective mind all together here. Mm. Wow, it hit the paper and rolled as the south node. Heck Yeah. Resolving past karmas associated to corruption and deep fears and pains having to do with all that is, un, you know, under the surface and taboo. So the south node being conjunct Pluto is definitely a place where we're uncovering um, a lot of the shadow and we're bringing it into consciousness and integrating it to become more whole. I'm going to roll one more time and also remind you that I am uh, doing an amazing, I'm involved with the Astrology Hub's inner circle this year and I'm going to be doing uh, the, the lunar, I'm going to be, be the lunar guide and hosting for the month of May. So the Taurus month, um, I'm going to be doing a forecast an astrological forecast as well as a whole class on um, how to incorporate astrology with the gene keys and we'll be doing ceremony and holding the space of in the full moon and the the new moon so I highly recommend I'll put in the comments here and in the link um, the uh, in the the comment box the link for if you want to sign up so one more planet here. Jupiter. Yay. Thank you for coming and blazing your truth in the 11th jinky of light. So much truth coming through this Jupiter Sagittarius. Um, Jupiter's in its home sign. It's in full power. Saturn's in its home sign, full power. And Neptune in its ruling sign in full power so we've got some really strong energy right now lots of possibility for traction and um i was gonna say oh right that nep that jupiter is going to be stationing retrograde april 10th so we'll tune in around that um i think i'm too tired to do one of these cards but i'll pick a card anyway for you that because this can be for you okay so I'm going to draw a card, and then this is something that you can do in your home. Creative contemplation. Poetry. 
pause and write a poem inspired by this key and then recite it. Well, we were on the 11, so who feels up to writing a poem about the 11th gene key? Moves from the shadow of obscurity to the gift of idealism and the city of light. Um, if you do write a poem, please post it. And that would be lovely because the transcendence of art is alive right now with all of this Pisces. Welcome to Aries. Happy eclipse. Um, sorry. I, um, I'm like, I, I, I. <laughs> happy equinox. Full moon in Libra. Oh, the moon is in the wrong place. I hope you've made it to the end of the recording to find the moon in its fullness in the very first degrees of Libra. Welcome to a new start. Love you all.